Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. My name is Gilberto Valdez Sequeira, and I was born in Havana, the city of Havana, the 16th of August, 1928. And in that period... Uh, the Cuban, the Cuban society was divided in, in well, in stages. But the middle, the middle class uh, has the opportunity to travel very often to the United States because in that period they didn't need visas for the first ninety years, I mean three months, and so the Cubans have a chance to fly and to travel to the United States for three months without any visa at all. So that means that the middle class, the middle class of, of Cubans uh, has this opportunity. So the, my mother, she was a millionaire. She was uh, working making uh, design of, of hats. So she has a, a, a a, a, a place where she she has three five workers with her, and he has a client a client uh, uh, of, of people of the middle and high society. So it means that we be, I've been in contact uh, uh, very often with people who have been traveling to the United States, and besides that, my my mother brother they have a a more brother so. The youngest brother of my, of, uh, me, my, my youngest uncle has a difference of only nine years with me. So it means that he was a teenager when I was about four or five years old. So that means that he was uh, all, uh, you know, a young, young Cuban who was all, all the time listening to music, jazz, and so forth. So I started listening to jazz. Uh, the, if, if from the radio, from the records, and so forth. That's where that was uh, the moment where I get the, you know uh, interested with the American music. So besides that, uh, the I have this when when I was I start studying uh, the high school and college. I started uh, work uh, singing in a choir, the choir of the uh, of the high high school. And then I met a lot of friends there who always was interested in in singing the American songs and so forth. So we start singing together. You may one with it making a second voice. There's another one came and make a third voice. So that means uh, uh, we started. As a matter of fact, we started singing there. So we made I made the first vocal quartet that we call it the Cuban Pipers. Because in that period, I was very fond with the uh, American vocal singers like the Mills Brothers, the Pipe Pipers, the Modern Air. So I, I, I was listening to all that kind of music. So we, I started making an arrangement. You know, the thing is very simple arrangement for the vocal, vocal chord. And that's more, more or less the idea. Do you like to explain, Diana, if you want something else about it? Can you talk about your trips to New York City and what you saw? All right. Okay. In 1948, because ah, first, my my mother she moves uh, after the Second World War. She 
she moved to to New York because you know was a, a very a, a great demand of uh, workers in that period. And in, so in 1945, my mother flown to New York, and she stayed there almost 14 years. So my mother went there to to work in a in a factory where they made hats and so forth. So I had I have had the opportunity to travel in 1948. I mean, when she was already settled, or, you know, economically settled in the states. So I flown in New York. So I flown to New York in 1948, and of course I have nothing to do except follow all the stars, the jazz musicians and singers. So I had had the opportunity to go and see Count Basie, Duke Ellington, uh, Harry James, and many, many other uh, musicians, you know, because I went every day. I, I spent my, all, the, all the afternoon and, uh, in, in Times Square, you know, and Broadway and so forth, every day. So that's, that was my first contact. With, uh, the, with the musicians because also my father, my stepfather was a musician. Oh. He was a, uh, he used to play trombone, you know, he was a trombonist. So when I was also very young, about 10, 10 years old, I started studying trombone. So when when my, my mother and my stepfather were, they moved to New York, my, my stepfather also as, as a musician, he was also a barbershop. A barber, and he opened a barber shop in in in, in New York, in the Hundred and Ten Avenue, and the top of uh, Central Park. And all the Cuban musicians that were their legs, they were there in New York in that moment. They used to go there, and you know, I cut their hair with my my, my dead father. His name was Humberto Gelabert. And well, that's more or less the. The opportunity I have during the period she was there, I, I spent a couple of, of years, a couple of time there, uh, almost every year while I was studying in high school. Can Can you recall uh, some of the clubs that you went to, music clubs? No, not really clubs because uh, I was very young. You know, uh, I was about. In, Nineteen years old, so what I, I I went in clubs, but during the day, not really clubs, but bars. In that period, there's a lot of bars there in 54 Avenue, I think, or in Broadway. I don't remember exactly. They have many bars with live music, you know, a pianist and a singer, and but I don't remember the name because all the, all those places have disappeared exactly. You know? That's true. Yeah. But you, but uh, yes, and and you mentioned you saw Duke Ellington, Count Basie. Uh, yeah, and the, one of the theater I remember was the Apollo Theater, and I had been also in Radio City to be, you know, one of the greatest show there, the music, the music hall. Or all the theater, I don't remember the names. I said, I said like very many years ago. Do you happen to to recall? Um, any of the Cuban musicians that used to come to your stepfather's uh, barbershop? Well, Machito, uh, Mario Bausa, uh, some of the conga players that I don't remember the name. And I remember that where my, my mother lives in, in New York was Madison Avenue. Madison Avenue, a few blocks for the, the bar where uh, Chano Apostle was killed. Mm. No, I think yeah, about a couple of blocks from there. So I have a, I have a chance to visit the place, but I never saw a Channel Post in New York. But I met him in Havana because the place where my grandmother lives, it was about um, a few blocks of the place he used to to rehearse all the all the, the composition, the congas, and the, for the carnival there. In the neighborhood where I live, in, where my my grandmother lives in Havana. Ah, what what neighborhood was that? Well, that's the Colon, very close to the uh, two two blocks from the Malecon, about three blocks from the Bravo Avenue. You know, more or less. Gotcha. Center Havana. Did did mm -hmm. you did you spend uh, 
any time with with Chano Pozo? No, no, I met him, but no, I, I, I never went there. They don't let me go there. <laughs> You're too, too young? I was, I, I was too young, yeah. So uh, I listened to music from outside, but I, but I, anyway, I met Chano Pozo much, much later as a musician, you know. Uh, and and um, did you ever encounter people like uh, Benny Moray? Yes, I met Benny Moray, yes, but uh, later on when I was a professional musician already, you know, I was a... Uh, it was in 1949, something like that. I met it personally. Okay, so your mm -hmm. f your first trip to New York was 1948. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you, and you were about 19. And I've been there, and I've, I've been also in 1949, 1950. You know, yeah. and, and then you became a professional musician. Can you talk about how you became a drummer? Well, yeah, so well, that's, uh, it's not a long story, but it's very interesting. You know, I make two quarters in my life. The first quarter was the Cuban Piper, as I said, when I was studying in the high school. Then I went to the university where I started uh, studying uh, dentistry, uh, ontologist, you know. And then they started the process of the revolution in, in Havana, and they uh, closed the university for one year. And that moment, I would, we decided instead of being, you know, without doing nothing during one year without classes, and then we decided to reorganize the quartet. And I made the second quartet was called the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers happened to be one of the most outstanding groups in Havana at that moment. So I started working in San Susi. In San Susi, in that moment, we have the, the, the guest artists many great artists like Johnny Mattis, uh, Tony Bennett, Ersa Kitt, Sarah Vaughan, and that is the problem. When, when Sarah Vaughan came to Havana with a trio, I get a very good, very good friend of uh, uh, the, the drummer, uh, Roy, Roy Haynes, is, is, is his name, Roy Haynes. So one day, because with the quarter was singing, we have a, a piano, a piano player who accompanied the quarter there in San Susi. So every time we we are in, engaged to play in some other places, I have to ask, what kind of instrument do you have? And they say, well, I have a, a this trumpet and saxophone, always have a flute and a violin. So I have to be changing the this uh, arrangement all the time. Mm. So we decided to, to accompany ourselves like the four Frenchman did, you know. Do you remember the four Frenchman quartet? Yes. Uh, so I, the, the vocal quartet, I was, uh, I, I made the arrangement very similar of, the, of that quartet, the four Frenchman. So then we decided to accompany ourselves like the four Frenchman, four Frenchman did. So... They start saying, well, I'm going to play the, this one says, I'm going to play the bass, the, the bass. The other one says, well, I'm going to play the guitar. And the other says, well, I'm going to take the saxophone. So I say, well, I'm going to play the drums. So I went to Roy Haynes and says, listen, we have decided this and this and this, but I don't know nothing about drums. <laughs> and then Roy Haynes, he says, well, I give you the first pair of sticks that I remember was the Ludwig stick of A7 with uh, nylon tips. <laughs> and then he said, well, tomorrow come to my hotel. He will stay in, uh, I think, if, if I remember, a national hotel. And he said, well, come, I'm going to give you uh, one, exactly a, a, a drummer friend of mine gave me his uh, method of uh, learning the drums to promote it here. And you are the best best person to give it to you. It was the the the... the Benson, Lou Benson, no, not the guitar player, Joy Benson, John Benson, the drummer. Okay. And there was that, yeah, that was the, the method he gave me. And he said, well, you have to take the, the stick like this. He said, so, and he showed me the first things. So I started studying by myself a little bit. That's the beginning when I started playing the drums. Wow, wow. So you, you were primarily self-taught from the method. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I just, because I I read music because I 
with my stepfather, I started learning trombone. So I, I was already in the third third grade of trombone. So I played trombone in that period. But in the moment I was working with the quartet, I needed a drummer, not a trombone player. Uh-huh, <laughs> uh-huh. Hey, let I me. Mean? Yeah, sure, sure. Necessity. Hey, let's let's talk about the 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 number of jazz musicians. For instance, I think it would surprise people uh, that Roy Haynes was in Cuba. Um, yes, of course. He, he, um, the, the pianist, I think, was Hank. Uh, Hank was Hank Jones, I think. Hank Jones, sure, that would make sense. Hank Jones. I see, yeah, yeah. Well, the, what, what was the most famous uh, trio that I complained in Star Rowan during the 50s, the 40s and the 50s? Was so. It- was it common for, for U.S. jazz musicians to come to Cuba? Was it a normal thing? Yes, it was a very normal thing, especially because during that period, during the 50s, uh, as far as we, um, you know, my, all my friends, you know, the friends that we get together every week, they were uh, jazz fans also. And we have old collection of records and so on and so forth. So we create a club. It was a, a Cuban jazz club where we get together instead of being doing it, uh, you know, uh, by ourselves. And we create a club where we put together all the the, the people who are love uh, jazz lovers, and then we start producing concert every week on Sunday uh, with a. a um, and in this and those concerts, sometimes we invite people that from the state to come and play with us. Like for instance, I remember Suit Themes, and I, well, I don't remember all the, the, the names right now because, but well, every every week or not every week, but at least once a month, we invite some musician to come to Cuba and and make a gig in in this for this club, you know. It was the and we have with the performance we do it sometimes and we start doing it in Tropicana or every Sunday afternoon and then we start doing it in the club very close to La Rampa that was called Havana 19, 1900. Mm. Well, and so in that club we start you know making the concert with a part of the musician of the Tropicana Orchestra with Armando Romeo and Bebo Valdez. Uh, Barreto, Barreto, Guillermo Barreto was the drummer, very good drummer. So we make jam session every week there, you know, at this place. And we have the chance to invite those musicians to come. And then in, in San Susi, as well, as I said, we have almost four Four, by month, every month we have at least four guests coming from the States, as I said, Johnny Bennett, uh, Sarah Bowen, Ersa Keith, Ooh. and many other, many other guys. So the, 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 the management of San Susi was different of the manager of Tropicana. So they look at, the, they, they have realized that San Susi was making a competence uh, for, uh, with, uh, with the Tropicana, so they decided to invite one of the star guests, and then it was the first time Nat King Cole came to Tropicana in that period. Oh. And yeah, so Trop- yeah, he came to Tropicana, so I, ha- I have the chance to meet him too. Well, I went to Tropicana because I was working in San Susi. For me, it was very simple to enter in Tropicana and go in backstage. So I met uh, also a and I can call and give a man and give a hook and so forth. Yeah. Hey, can, okay. you t- can you tell us about the club San Susi? What was it like? Well, you know, it, the, the Tropicana nightclub is very famous around the world because it's the only one who stand, still stand, you know. San Susi was bigger, I mean, larger, uh, beautiful and famous than Tropicana. It was a really, really a beautiful, beautiful place. And when Tropicana started working, uh, the, being as a, an open air, San Susi also was an open air nightclub. 
you know. But the difference is that the state was, di- was divided in five five levels. The, you know, the, the central state and three or four, like, uh, flying source, flying source, you know. Oh. Suspended, suspended on the air by a uh, stream of water. It seems, it looks like being floating on the air, suspended wow. by water, you know. Wow. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And there, that was a place where the real high, high society of Cuba used to go. While in Tropicana was the middle, high, you mean the, 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 the less high, high society, you know. So the, the, new, the new high society, the, the, the one who used to go to, to Tropicana was the less expensive Tropicana. Okay, San Susi was very, very expensive. Ah. And, and that was the place uh, that I, I've been working to. I see. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> For see. For a couple of years. I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd like to talk about another thing. Um, television in Cuba and your role in... Uh, being on television when television was new in Cuba. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, during the 50s, when they built in Vedados area, the uh, hotel uh, Havana Libre, which was in that moment, the Hilton Hotel, Havana Hilton Hotel, it was in 23rd uh, Street and L in Vedado. Right in front of the, the the building, the hotel, they start building a new center of radio. It was radio center where is the Yara Theater? Was in that moment was the Warner Bros. Theater movie. And in that building, they they put one of the most outstanding radio station in Havana, CMQ. And was CMQ who started with the television in Havana? You know, and they make uh, they they start importing and making a studio there. When they make, make this building, they start creating uh, television studios. And when I was in San Susi with the with the quartet, I was invited to 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 start working on the television. So I've been in television every week because they have two star uh, program at night. One was uh, Casino de la Alegría, and the other one was uh, Night Noches de Partagas. Two different programs. One was in Wednesday, and the other one was in Thursday. So one week I was invited to go to one uh, one in the in Casino de la Alegría one week, and next week I go to the, the Jueves de Partagas. So every week I used to be on television. Hmm. As far, yeah, yeah. So the people used to call us, you know, the the how to call the the TV icon, you know, <laughs> because we are we were all the time in television. And besides, we make other programs like uh, Cafe Pilon program and many others, many others, many other programs. We've been all the time in television in that period, during the 50, 57, 58. And TV was was new around the world, but Cuba was one of the first countries to have TV. Yeah, Cuba was one of the first countries in Latin America who has television, because they the, uh, there was a uh, American, you know, United States company who was creating a new system of television, and they tried it and test they tested in putting a, a television pro- pro- channel in in Havana, so that they were. They give the you know the good price this the television system to the radio and television uh, company Havana, which is CMQ. That's why. Great. Hey, let's talk about um, El Zora, which is uh, you know the big the the jazz yeah. club. That you had an interesting role in in saving and preserving La Zora. Yeah. Tell yeah. tell what it was. You know, how, how, how did it start, and then how was it almost closed, and how did it get saved? Yeah. yeah. Well, the problem is that the, when the the development of the, the size of the Vedado, we call it La Rampa, when they where they build the Havana Libre Hotel, I mean the the Hilton 
the Havana Hilton Hotel, right in front of the Creative Radio Center. Then they will build uh, another big hotel in very not very far from there. And they have uh, where is the where they are the, the uh, airlines offices in at the end of uh, the Twenty Third Avenue. I mean La Rampa, very close to the Malecon. That was a real uh, commercial center, you know. And so that area became very popular. So they start they started there opening different clubs. And at the same time, you know that in that period during the fifties they allowed to uh, open uh, casinos in Havana. So that means that all the little places where music, with music, they have the slot machine and everything, you know. So there was a great, to, to attract the people to, to play with the machine, they need a live music. So that's why every place they have music. One of those places was exactly La Zorra y El Cuervo. But in that period, La Zorra El Cuervo was not a jazz club, as it is. He put, uh, you know, he make a contract to different kind of music, mus musician and music. Sometimes they have Cuban music, sometimes they have jazz, sometimes they have boleros, you know, different. So with the arrival of the revolution, you know, everything was closed down. Nothing was working, was, everything was closed. So there was a company, uh, uh, called Cari Show, and who the 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 chef, the, the president of this company, uh, during and it was in 1970 19, something or 1980, 1980, yeah, more or less, 1980, decided to reopen La Torre El Cuervo as it was at the very beginning. And then he created, he organized it to be a jazz club instead of a different kind of music, just jazz club. Yeah, but, well, yeah, but they started they started arranging the place during the at the end of the second second half of the eighties, and at the nineties they reopened it during the nineties. That is more or less. So they, when they opened that, they started they, they, the one who the, the musicians who Maybe the opening of that club was uh, Bebo Valdez. Oh, really? Chucho Valdez. Sorry, sorry. Oh, Chucho. Chucho Valdez. Chucho. No, Chucho. Valdez. Chucho. <laughs> I said Bebo. Chucho Valdez. was Chucho Valdez who opened that place. And also, Borri Carcasses. Borri Carcasses also there were there in the opening of the, of the club. Now, was there a time when, when La Zora was going to close down and be changed? Um, yes, 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 you know, jazz is not a, a music that for, for everybody. You have to be a jazz lover to be in a jazz club. So what happened? Sometimes the, the tourism in Cuba was very low or very, very down. And the entrance to be in the, the in, in, in Cyber, to enter the Sorry Equipment, you have to pay in CUC. So the population have to, doesn't have the chance to expend 10 or $15 to get enter the Soria Cuervo. So the Cuban, they have very little opportunity to go to La Soria Cuervo. So really what La Soria Cuervo needs, needs as an audience was people with enough money to pay to enter. Mm -hmm. That means the tourism. But the tourism was very low. And so the enterprise who who was leading this says, well, we are losing money. So they decided to convert it in a pizzeria, you know, to sell pizza. Pizza. So, oh, yeah, pizza. <laughs> and, you know, the musicians that we were working in that period of that, like Hernando Pesnusa, Bellita, myself with the uh, Jazz Generation, and we get together and then we start discussing that cannot be, is it possible we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be without any place to work because there are no many places in Havana for, for playing jazz, it was only La Sorre El Cuervo and Jazz Café in that moment, only two places to make real jazz. So they we request uh, uh, for a meeting with the uh, president of that company who lead all, you know, who would, all the restaurants in Cuba or in Havana, they are 
under that, that direction. And so the director, we request to have a meeting with the director of that company, and we explain him how does it work. You know, say, listen, this is that, and say, no, no, we have to close it down. So we invite him to we say, well, come one, one night and you will see what we do. So, you know, I don't remember who was the musician who played that night. Well, he came, he came at night with some of the, the people of the staff of the company. And they are a lot, they say, okay, well, right, yeah, you're right. That's a very good thing, you know. Well, but, so they decided not to do it. So that's why, it really, they appreciate us so much as Lazo Pueblo because we stand up and say that we were not, you know, are, are, we do not agree that they close it down. Not only because we have no work, because it's one of the most, you know, most beautiful places to make jazz, you know. And that, that's more or less the story of it. Well, it's it's a great thing that you all got together and, and saved uh Azora, yeah. because yeah, Lazora, yeah. it's very important. Hey, could you yeah. talk? Could now for a while you lived in Europe in in uh, in Paris, I believe. Well, yeah, I stay as you know as uh, as sojour. We stay four years in Paris, two and a half years in Sweden, Stockholm, and three years in Italy. Ah, no. Now, so, in, in where did you where, where did you perform in Paris? Well, so many places I don't remember. <laughs> but you were the most yeah many you were, places. You were busy. You, know. you were busy. Yeah, yeah, all the time. You know, making you know gigs and the uh, uh, Opera Palace and and the Becky Bucky Power. But no, Bucky. I don't remember now the Bucky. Well. In many clubs, but the most important club I played in in, in Paris was in that period the the the, the White Elephant, Elephant Blanc. It, it was one of the most important nightclubs in in Paris in that moment, and I worked there for one and a half years every night. Mm. And you had a quartet, mm -hmm. or what was your group? Well, it was my, my group. I have two groups there. One, a Latin group, with, uh, we play with Cuban music, and we have a quartet that plays jazz. And in one, I play the timbales, and the other one, I play the drums. <laughs> ah, ah. So, yeah. so, so there was an audience for Latin music in Paris in that time. Yes, yes, yes. In that model, you remember Paris, all the, the jazz musicians, when they want to get famous, they go first to jazz, to, to Paris. Mm. You know, mm. all of them, all of them. I, there in Paris, I met Donald Byrd. I met uh, Modern Jazz Quartet. I met, uh, well, so many people I met there in Paris. I came. I used to play, make gigs, you know, jam station there where, in the place in where uh, Sidney Bichere used to play. Ah. In Paris, yeah. Paris. Yeah, they, 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 Paris yeah. and France are, have always been very friendly to jazz. Yeah. And, but also, people may not know, but very friendly to Latin music, for, to Cuban music, way back, even in, yeah. the, even in the 20s. Yeah, you, uh, exactly. The, um, what they do in Paris in that period, I don't know what they're doing now. Uh, every club, every place has three kinds of music. They play jazz, American music and jazz, Latin music, which is Cuban music and Brazilian, etc. And they have tango music, I mean, Argentina music. Everybody has to do that. Ah. Because that was the, what the audience really request. You know. In that period, the, the tango was very famous in Paris. But Latin music was also very famous, and jazz also being very famous. So they have to play everything, you know, those three kind of music being in every single place in Paris in that moment. And what, what period was this when you were there in Paris? What years? During this, I, I arrived there during the 60s, 1959. Yeah, I arrived in 59. Well, it was December 1959, so I stayed there. The December, then during the 60s, 61, 62. 
63rd year. Then you went to Sweden, and in Sweden you, you saw Bebo. Well, no. I I met Bebo in Italy. Ah, in Italy, okay. In Italy, yes. Because I was working with a trumpet player. He was a solist, so he engaged my group. I was working at the moment in L'Elephant Blanc, the White Elephant in Paris. And he came and make a contract for the, the group to accompany him in Mon, Mon, uh, St. Maurice, St. Maurice in Switzerland. Ah, St. Maurice, yep. St. Maurice. So from St. Maurice, he said he, he got a gig and a, a contract to work in Milano. So we, we then we took the train to go to Milano. But in Milano, the, the contract, you know, didn't realize it. They didn't arrive yet. We stayed there for a couple of weeks and nothing happened. No tomorrow, no after tomorrow, and nothing <laughs> happened, you know. Yeah. And so the pianist, it was a French, French, French pianist, he decided to go back to Paris. He said, yo, I don't, I don't get it here. I, I go back because I have work in Paris. And so uh, two or three musicians of, the, of, of my group, they, they went back. So I organized a trio to survive in, in Italy. Uh, I, I was uh, an Italian, I think it was Italian, I don't remember who, an Italian pianist and a bass player who came from, from Spain. He was uh, the brother of Chapotin. Ah. Uh, well, he was, yeah, he, his name was Jose Chapotin. He was a very good bass player who used to play in New York. And he, he was in, in, he was a Cuban musician, you know, Mm -hmm. And he, he used to play there in New York for many years, but he was in Europe. And he he went from Italy, no, from Spain to Italy. And I saw him because he was a friend of mine. He was a, friend, a good friend of mine. So I say, well, Ch uh, Chapotin, you are here, so well, let's make a trio. And I engaged a, a, a Italian pianist, Chapotin in the bass, and I was in the drum. But in that moment... Uh, uh, the trumpet player that was uh, the, the guest star of my group uh, said, well, I need a pianist, but I, 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 there's a pianist, a Cuban pianist who's arriving from, from Spain. And so he invited me to go to the train station to meet him. And uh, why, when, when the train stopped, the, the pianist player was Bebo Valdez. Ah. You know, that's it. And say, oh, Bebo, what are you doing here? Well, you know, the, you know how, how it is. When old friends get together, and and I say, well, listen, Bebo, uh, the contract here in Italy has fell down. I don't know why he he called me to call me on and play, but I, but I have a trio, and it would be very good if you if we play together. So I say I I change the pianist, and so I introduce Bebo Valdez playing with the trio, and with that with having that trio, as far as be. The wife of of, of Bebo Valdez, which she was a Sweden, so it was Swedish, and I and I say, well, why don't we get a contract to go to Sweden? I say, okay, all right, we start writing to him and say we have a we have a a contract to go and work in Sweden, and then we took the train and we went to Sweden. Huh? <laughs> Very that's good. why that's why that's why I never returned to 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 France again because I went to Sweden and from Sweden. I went back to, to Italy, and from Italy I returned to Havana. I see, I see. Now, of course, you yeah. knew you knew Bebo from Cuba very well. Yeah, of course. He was a pianist of Tropicana, where we, and when we made the, 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 the young station, one of the best the, the, the musicians was all for Bebo Valdez. I know I met Chucho Valdez when he, Chucho Valdez was uh, about 11 years old. Uh -huh. I met Chucho Valdez, yeah. So we were, we were very good friends, and we, well, so he, so he was the, yeah. the, the pianist at the um, El, Trop, El Tropical, El Tropicana. Yeah, he, he used to play in Tropicana. Now, yeah. now um, but he also had his own orchestra, didn't he, at some point in Cuba or no? Yeah, yeah, he, he makes his own, his own band for working on the radio and so forth. And the problem is that he created a band. I don't remember exactly the, the name of the band. But the problem, he created a new rhythm. He called it Batanga. And the rhythm of Batanga was very difficult because uh, the percussion instrument, the main percussion instrument was the Bata. 
and not everybody know how to play the bata. Oh, bata drums. Really? See? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The bata drum have two skin. One on the, both sides. You know, it's different. You have to play with both hands. One hand the left and the right. And it, it's not very simple. Not everybody know how to play the batas. But in that very moment, he created that band. It started the success of uh, uh, Perez Prado in Mexico. So it was a competition of the batanga with the, with the mambo. Uh -huh. And the, ma mambo, have the, the mambo had the, with the great success. So the batanga disappeared there. But a very wonderful band. Incredible mm. band with an arrangement much, much better than the, the arrangements of, of, Chan, of uh, Perez Prado. But no success because nobody else can play the, the music because nobody can have a bata, a bata drums in, in Japan, you know. Instead, the, the one of, of, of Perez Prado, you have a, a, conga, a conga, and everybody plays conga in Cuba, you know. Yeah, everybody, literally. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. Everybody. Yeah, so, so now I have to imagine that including a bata drummer was a very mm -hmm. unique unique and unusual and original thing to do at that time it was unique it was original it was un yeah yeah nobody yes, no because uh, as i said the arrangement of Bebo was incredible it sounds like like stan kenton with cuban rhythm you know ah yeah wow. it was a stan kenton band where the best solid musician in that period trumpet saxophone the bed, the, you know, the top musician in that moment in Havana that used to play jazz with us all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, they were in the band. You know, the band was incredible. It sounds like 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 Stan Kenton mm. with a Latin rhythm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Hey, speaking of great yes, great bands, I I really admire the music, uh, the big band music. Uh, what do they call it? Banda, big uh, big banda or whatever. Uh, of yeah, um, big band, yeah. big band of um, Benny Moray. I always thought his. Or it just had it was very lively. It was very powerful. Did you ever get to hear mm -hmm. his or, his orchestra when it had its all its members playing at the same time? Yeah, sure, of course. As a matter of fact, one of his arrangement arrangers was a very good friend of mine, and we have studied together in in the same high school. Uh, how, how was his name? Oh, my God! Yeah, my, it'll, it'll it'll come to you. I. I can barely remember. Yeah. I can barely remember half my <laughs> names either. Believe me. Hey, yeah. hey speaking um, of speaking of um, the bata in, in drum in, in a band, you were also the the, the manager and the representative of uh, Irakeri. Yes, I did. Tell tell us about that experience, if you would. Well, uh, you know, when but one day I was uh, you know get mad with the musician I have in the band. So I decided to not to play for a, li a little moment. So I was engaged to work in, in the recording enterprise in Havana. So I became the second person in, in recording there. I was the, the chief and I was a, a recording organizer, uh, you know, in, in the Grim. So I was called because my experience with uh, orchestras and my experience working in with uh, musicians and so forth, they called me to to, to be part of the uh, of the commercial enterprise that where they were created in Havana, with the commercial enterprise for for artists. So I started working with Cuartista, and I was this uh, the the representative of the old popular music in Havana. So when I started working in that that uh, enterprise. Uh, I get in contact with uh, some lawyer here in New York that he put me also in contact with Sheridan uh, uh, Gold. Mr. Sheridan Gold was one of the uh, artist management in New York in that moment. And he said, well, I don't know nothing about the Cuban artists and the Cuban music and no, but I would like to know about it. And I say, we invited, I invite him to come to Havana, to go to Havana. And then I prepare a concert, a special concert for, for, for him in Tropicana, where I invited this, the Iraqis to play for him. And there 
was the beginning of the whole story because he was the one who brought the Iraq heiress in New York. Ah, and so, you, you went with them on tour in the United States, yes, and Europe? Yes, yes, I, yeah, I, I, be, I did in New York. We've been in 20, 21 or 23 states. Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to talk about a, a story that you and your wife shared with me that was so fascinating. You were on a ship together that went to yeah. what, what to what island did it go to or what country did it go to well yeah you know the, the, this uh, uh, almost every year or every four years uh, a festival called cari festa you know cari festa was a festival that uh, take all the the artists from all the little island around in the caribbean islands so this cari festa was taking place in barbados so I was the one who was at the front, in front of the, all the artists. I were in. we we, we uh, they uh, organized a ship a ship to put all the artists there. Was about three hundred artists going into Barbados, and one was the Iraqueres, was the Pedro La Frocan, uh, some group for ballet, uh, contemporary uh, contemporary dance dancers. Of Rafael de Santiago's a choir. Well, about 300 musicians and artists going into that in that ship. I was there in front. And Iliana, he was in that uh, commission as a uh, translator because there was also conference and everything. And, and then we met there in the ship. We've been together. There. But the ship, it was in 1981. The moment of returning the ship from Barbados to Havana. The, the ship broke down in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. Hmm. So we have to go to uh, Curaçao, where they have the, uh, to repair the ship, and we stay there in Curaçao 21 days. So in those 21 days, you know, we have time to make concerts, dance, and, because there's nothing to do except that. You know? <laughs> Yeah, because the ship was there trying to be repaired. Yeah. We have nothing to do yeah. except make making music, invite all the people from Curaçao to come and see the the show there. And yeah, there we get get together. It, Up to now. It, 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 <laughs> that's how you met your wife. Yeah. It must exactly. have been it must have been an amazing cultural experience for the people of Curaçao. Yeah, it was really. It was. So far that every time we go down of the of the boat to go to the center, all the taxi drivers who pass right in front of the, of the pier, they say, "Hey, come in, come in!" and take us free. It was about two kilometer or three kilometers from the, the pier to the center of the of the of the of the, of the, of the, of the island, of the town, uh, and the city. And they take off their free. They didn't, <laughs> we didn't pay <laughs> because they were so far. Because some of them, they came to see the show free also, you know. Oh, uh, okay. I was very, very, very interested in that, that period. Yeah, really. Okay. Hey, I'd like to talk about one of your projects, um, Sax Ophelia, the group. Oh, Sax Ophelia. Yes, Sax Ophelia group. You know, uh, my friend Emilio, he passes away because he... Yeah, he passed. He passes away because he was very ill. And, but one day he came to see me. Uh, we, no, we met there in, in in the house of one of my friends, Rafael Quinones, and then he explained me that he was trying to make a, a quintet, well, saxophone quintet. All right, well, so he he, he brought me to a rehearsal and so forth, and I say, okay, well, what you needed to play to have live music because he was accompanying himself with a background recording, you know. And I say, it's no good. That's very good for rehearsing, but to, to be, you know, to make a, a, a performance in front of a, an audience, is that is no good. It's no beautiful. That you need at least a trio to accompany a piano, a bass, and a drum. I never thought to be a drummer of the group, but I say, well, what you need is that. And he say, okay, you are the drummer. Look for the pianist on the bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I, I, I look for a pianist. I look for the bass player. And we start, you know, rehearsing with them and so forth and so forth. And everything was okay. 
Well, as far as I had the contact with all the, you know, the Sorri Cuervo, with the jazz cafe and many other jazz places, I said, okay, we, we are ready. So I, you know, I engaged Zero to see those uh, management there. And I, well, they contract the, the group to play there. Great. And, and that, that's the beginning with Sartofilia. Hey, speaking, speaking. But he was go- a very, he was a very, very good musician. And the arrangement he, he, he did really was very, very good. Really, I really enjoyed it. It's a pity that he passed away. Mm. Hey, speaking mm-hmm. of, of connections, um, when Dizzy Gillespie and Earl Father Hines and Stan Getz uh, and Ray Mantillo and David Amram came to Cuba in 1977, I believe yeah. you, you were the host. Yes, I, I did. Exactly. That was because uh, the period when I invited uh, Sheldon Gold to come to Havana, he, it happened that uh, to get in contact with a television director from Canada, which I don't remember his name right now, and they decided to, to make a big, big show in Havana. And that was the beginning of the Cuban-American encounter. In, in, in the Karma Theater, where many of them, you know, the funny old star came, uh, uh, Chris Christopherson and Rita Coolidge, uh, Stan Getz with uh, the quartet, uh, I don't know the name of the quartet, jazz quartet, where with uh, the bass player, very famous. Uh, uh, oh, I oh, forgot my name. Yeah. So, well, they, many, many musicians came from the to, we could go down to Cuba and to perform there at the Karma Theater with the big, big, big show. And you and you helped organize that and make that happen. Yes, yes, because I was I was in charge of all the popular music in Cuartita. I was the one who organized all those things. Wow. You know, well, Joe's organized. I say, do this and do. I need this. I do. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I did nothing just to just to to you know, to lead the people to do the things. You know. Well, that was good. That was, and, yeah. And, and then and then just last year, um, you made it possible for David Amram to return after forty years and uh, perform yeah. at the jazz festival. Yeah, but, yeah. But that was the fir- the first time I met I met him was in nineteen seventy seven when he came for the first time with a group with Dizzy Gillespie and. With the with the cruise, uh, what's the name of the cruise? Was uh, some kind of cruise ship? Daphne, yep. Daphne, Daphne. And in that moment, I was really starting working with school artista. And the first job I did was take care of, uh, of the group in uh, preparing the performance at the Maya Mela Theater. Do you remember Maya? Oh Theater yeah, it's still Maya? it's still there, and people, yeah. you can still go to yes, the Maya. Yeah. yeah. So they 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 made the they made a performance at the Mela Theater and it was the, the the first thing I I did was to prepare that you know to get it in contact with those people not very deep but well I make all those contacts there so in that moment I met uh, David Amram and later I came to New York with the uh, Papines Quartet Do you remember the, the sure. Papines Quartet yeah, they the, the, so, yeah. They visit they they visit New York in 1977, and I was the one who was uh, you know selected to go with them to New York, and then I met also uh, David Amran and we visited his place and we've been together many times, having lunch together and talking a lot. And then uh, uh, and then uh, I had contacted you. Uh, about David, and and you made it possible for David to perform at the uh, Havana Jazz Festival in in, in 2018. Thanks, yeah. thanks to Bobby, yeah, Bobby exactly. Carcasses made that uh, possible. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. But Bob, maybe Bobby Carcasses make it possible because Bobby and I we 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 are very good friends from many years. As a matter of fact, in 1959, we flown together to to Europe to make the the tour. I've been mean, working together for many years in in, in Paris, in, in Sweden. About yeah, many years we've worked worked together in in Europe. Great. Well, thank you know, thank you so much for this time. And I have one last question. Uh, 
Cuba is a small country. It's it's true. It's not it's not Russia. It's not China. It's not the United States. It's a small country, and it yeah. it has about eleven million people. And, yeah. And yet the musical culture and the musical power of Cuba is like a country a hundred times its size. So yeah. can you tell me, based on your life in Cuba, <laughs> what are the things that make Cuban musicians so special and so powerful creatively? Because they certainly are for such a small country to create so much amazing music. Yeah, well, the problem is like, you know, uh, every uh, society or civilization or country, whatever you like to you like to call it, they have a specialized, their, their own way of living. For instance, you can say, for instance, that in Hungary, they have the most greatest violinist, violinist, or Italy has the best opera singers. Cuba is due to make you know, Latin music. Okay. So, yeah, making music. All the, all the, all the Cubans, they know how to make music, even if they don't play any, any instrument. They can say, sing, and anybody in Cuba can say, sing a wawanko, or or dance a rumba. You know, the Cuban they are due really for 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 music. But you have to realize first that when the at, uh, when the the jazz was starting in the states during the, at the la, at the end of the nineteenth century, the develop of music in Cuba was at the same time the same and the same. Uh, reason that made possible the creation the, the the creation of the jazz in the state was the same reason of the creating of the of the Cuban music in that the same period. That's what I used to say that American jazz and Cuban jazz is the same. They started in the, at the very very beginning, but the Cubans the Cuban they have a, a, a gift for music, and decide they. Uh, in Cuba, they, they they really make some conservatories, very very good conservatories with um, uh, the professor of the conservatory. Not now, but at the very beginning, very very good professor that really prepared the musician to be good musician. But now, after the revolution, you know, they create the the ENA the the mid, middle middle school yes. middle school of music and they made the isa the superior school of music every year when it comes graduated from those schools they are the most you know i i don't know how to explain it but in english but great musicians you know with a, a, a very profound a preparation technical prepare technically intellectually and it's incredible so every year we have hundreds of musicians coming out of, from those schools the ENA and ISA but the problem is well all of them they want to use the scene, uh, make it their own groups and that's why that well that's the reason why it's like the baseball everybody and <laughs> boxes, they, they want to you know they they like to 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 compare the, the expertise with foreign people. And the musician is the same, so that when you go all around the world, you find Cuban musicians playing in every place. Yes. <laughs> in Europe, in, in America, in South America, in Africa, whatever you go, you find a Cuban musician playing. That's right. That's it. That's right. Yeah, the, the, I, I, I don't know if people understand how sophisticated the education for music is in Cuba. I mean, every every music student learns all the classic music, uh, and then takes that skill and applies it to the Cuban music. Yeah, exactly. Because as a matter of fact, uh, in, in, in the conservatory, they don't allow the musicians to when they are studying there to play uh, popular music. They have to to attach only to the classical music. But the classical music is that gives you the expertise in each instrument. The Cuban music, you don't have to learn it. You have it in your in your in your soul. That's right. But that is that is they are very very hard, very strong uh, teaching music in Cuba. That's very strong. That's great. Well, um, 
again, Gilberto, thank you so much for this uh, this time and and telling this remarkable history uh, that you lived. You know, it's not just from a book; it's yeah. your it's from your life. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, as you can see, as you can realize, I was born in 1928. So it's a few days only. I I arrived to the 90s. That's right. <laughs> I'm 90 years old already. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, 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 yeah. I, I didn't get to tell you I'm a little late, but happy birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Great. And uh, I hope to see you in Havana next time I'm there. All right. And I'm looking forward to it. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.